think about how terrifying it was for me and I was I was a US citizen of dual citizenship through my dad I was going into a place where they spoke English in a place where I understood loosely the culture and still I found it an enormous culture shock and I found it a really difficult transition I was desperately homesick and I think about that all the time when I think about our international students arriving here many of our students of course not coming with English as a first language and coming from vastly different cultures, coming here with no network, with no community. Heidi Piper is a director international at Griffiths University. A well-known and respected figure in Australian international education, Heidi is reputed for her leadership and generous approachability. Qualities she attributes in part to having had own experience as an international student facing the challenges of living far from home. Heidi, welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. Prepping for this uh, interview, we discovered that you're not only a superstar in international education, but that you've got a former past as another type of superstar. Come on, tell us about it. (laughs) (laughs) I feel I, I always feel like I'm talking about my past life when I talk about this. Uh, I was a fencer once upon a time. It um, my my dad had fenced at university in the U.S. and we were growing up on the Gold Coast and there was a fencing coach working at the Gold Coast Police Citizens Youth Club of all places. And my dad said, this is a great sport. We should all be doing that. So we became one of those dreaded families where the whole family does the sport. You arrive en masse at competitions. In those early days, my mum used to make our fencing outfits. Um, I just, I know we'd, we'd all be trundling around in a combi van going to competitions. I can see now that it was a completely life-changing activity for me. I am very competitive by nature and I discovered that as I was doing a a sport and I did that from age nine until uh, I moved to Adelaide in 1987. There was an American fencing coach coaching through the Academy of Sport there and then I was heading overseas to the Junior World Championships at uh, in the US at Notre Dame and um When I got over there, I was staying with my aunt and uncle and I said to my aunt, wouldn't it be great to get a scholarship and go somewhere like Notre Dame? And she said, well, that doesn't just happen, Heidi. And she got on the phone and like an agent and basically sold me. So I spent a few months there and then stayed and started a Bachelor of Arts degree at um, Notre Dame, which is in or Notre Dame in the French, I know, Marine, but, but in the American, we say Notre Dame and um, started there in the fall um, a Bachelor of Arts degree and life changing. And you went on to win a what is it called? NCAA championship. I did. It's like the pinnacle of the pinnacle of, of college sport in America. Yeah, it is. It was it was really exciting. I will never forget it. Actually, it was extraordinary. Uh, I was also really lucky during that time. A lot of the fencing teams in the US had international members, so the the universities there would recruit internationally because fencing wasn't such a big sport in the US at that stage. So I had colleagues that we would meet up with it multiple times through the year at competitions from Italy, from Germany, uh, from the UK, from Poland, from all over. So if I if I look back to then, I can see the influences over where my career was going to head, even though I didn't realise it at the time. And what was it like studying at uh, Notre Dame? <laughs> I often say to people it was like living in a movie. So I had grown up on the Gold Coast, literally like a Muriel's wedding kind of childhood, Um, going to the beach after school. We did body surfing in my high school for the last three weeks of phys ed of every year and a pretty kind of relaxed, loose existence, I have to say. And then I ended up at this extraordinarily Catholic university, very strict, um, separate dorms for men and women and you weren't allowed in dorms of the opposite sex Overnight, there was a priest living in every dorm. You had to study theology. You had to study philosophy. Very different university structure, uh, on-campus life. I was a couple of years older than most of my classmates, um, it, but it felt like living in a movie. And, of course, well, you don't know this, but my freshman year was Notre Dame's last national championship. So I was there at a really significant time in history when Lou Holtz was the coach. Um, Ragi Bishmal was our 
running back and amazing. So if at the time I didn't appreciate it, people, when they find out I went there, say to me, did you go to football games? And I said, well, you had to go to football games. If you were at Notre Dame, you went to football games. It was the religion that sat alongside Catholicism at Notre Dame. And I was so blessed to actually have been there during a national championship year. And you're so open and friendly. What was it like arriving there? A little bit terrifying because all my most of my classmates arrived with their parents. You know, the whole going away to school that the Americans do, mum and dad drive you there and then they take you out shopping and they take you to the to buy all your bedding and to buy the things you need for your room and so on. I was so lucky. My freshman year roommate was the most wonderful woman and we're, we're still in touch loosely, Christmas card touch, and her family kind of took me under their wing. So as they took her out to buy things, they took me with them and I um, and, and I since had Christmases and Easters with them. Um, I was really lucky. The other thing is Notre Dame does not do fraternities and sororities, which, which I'm pretty happy about. You very much connect with the people in your dorm. So instantly the women that I was in a dorm with and the other freshmen in that dorm became my circle. And I am still in touch with quite a few of them. And my best friend from that time, Julie, who was my sophomore year roommate, is still one of my closest friends. How has that experience informed your approach to things now that you're leading an international office team inside an Australian uni? It's a good question, Rob. I think about it all the time. I think about how terrifying it was for me. And I was I was a US citizen, of dual citizenship through my dad. I was going into a place where they spoke English in a place where I understood loosely the culture and still I found it an enormous culture shock and I found it a really difficult transition. I was desperately homesick and I think about that all the time when I think about our international students arriving here. Many of our students, of course, not coming with English as a first language and coming from vastly different cultures, coming here with no network, with no community. I'm really fortunate in my role to oversee our international student experience team and our amazing Griffith Mates program, which is a group of Australian and international students who just help to welcome and give a soft landing to our international students. And I think I know the value of that program because I remember what it felt like. I've never forgotten it, what it felt like to be somewhere and be a little bit overwhelmed by how different everything was. Um, And that any little interaction you have at that point, positive interaction can make all the difference when you're feeling a bit lost and uncertain. It strikes me, Heidi, that you're somebody who's incredibly generous. Every time I've come across you at a conference or, you know, we've caught up in person uh, on on the campus at Griffith, you've always been so incredibly generous with your time and with your experience. Why is that? I've been incredibly lucky in my career to have amazing mentors and sponsors and people who've taken me under their wing and taught me everything they knew. So it seems natural to me to pass that on. I do often say to people, I'm a busybody and a know-it-all. I love to know everything. I love information. I love to understand where we fit and where I fit in the big picture. And then I, I just feel compelled to make sure that others understand that too and try to understand where they fit and the difference they're making. I think in the transaction of our jobs, and there is a lot of transactional activity in our jobs. There's a lot of emailing. There's a lot of going to com- um, committee meetings for me. There's a lot of writing papers. It's really important not to forget why we're doing that. We're doing it in service of transformation for people, whether it's bringing international students here or setting up programs to support them or sending our Australian students overseas. What we're really seeking to do is transformation. And I think people can only understand that if they're clear that their role has a part to play in that. I also work on the assumption, you know, we work with an extraordinary community of people and I look at at some of those coming up behind and they're just amazing and I think any of them could be my boss one day. There's all of this talent, there's all these amazing people. Why wouldn't I want to infuse them with knowledge and enthusiasm that if they do end up being my boss or my colleague at another university, that they'll be really good in that role and that they will make a difference for the people who work for them, the people who work with them and the students that they're, they're making a difference for. I've got a question for you in regards to anyone that's only just started in international education that's kind of um, finding out about the different roles that exist and so on and would like to find a mentor. 
how would you recommend they go about it? Because it's it's hard to approach someone, know how to who to approach, how to go about it. What would be your advice? It's a really good question, Maureen. I think it takes a bit of bravery. If I think about some of the young professionals I've met when we're having International Aid Association of Australia drinks or at some of our conferences, you have to be willing to approach people. You have to be willing, perhaps after someone's presented at a conference, to go up to them. And I've, Rob, I've seen you do this over the years, to go up and say, that was amazing, that was great, I love what you said about this. Could I send you an email? Could I follow up with you? Um, and I find that I'm really impressed actually, when young professionals do that with me. But I'm really honest with them too. I have to be honest. Over the years when people have said, would you mentor me? I say, well, let's let's have a chat and then you can decide because I'm pretty honest about this is really tough too. And I say, you know, I've, I've balanced having a family and rising in my profession and managing long work hours and managing travel because I had a mother who lived with me as well as a husband. I had this extraordinary infrastructure and not everyone has that. And I say, you need to think really carefully about what you want because this is a lot of work. Uh, it's amazing. The work we do is incredible. A lot of it is also about timing. You know, I was really fortunate to have a sponsor who kind of promoted me at the right time in my family life and my career. And that's really important too. So I'm, I'm a little bit honest as a mentor. I find that the people who seek me out are often women with school age children. Sometimes they've come from the mobility area, which is, which is what I was in right before I became a deputy director. And they say, I see in you the situation I'm in now. Usually what they need in my experience is, is not knowledge, it's confidence. I think there's a, you know, the imposter syndrome piece is is a really challenging one it's particularly challenging for women um and and often they come to me and i say you've got everything you need i see it i hear it you've got everything and sometimes it's just giving them that bit of confidence to speak up and even strategizing a bit about okay how might you prepare a presentation for this particular occasion that will show everyone what you're capable of and what you know and change people's concept of you it, in a university particularly big organizations to, to get that next step, people have you in their mind in the role you're in. So making sure that people see your capacity to move beyond that is um, takes a bit of strategic thought about what your opportunity might be to position yourself a little differently. Um, the, the other thing I do, I think, I've, have I done this with you, Rob? It's my latest thing is to ask people what their superpower is and make them make them think about it. I did it with one of our teams recently. Because I said, when you start to think about other jobs or when you go for an interview, you are going to have to be clear about what you bring, not just to the role, but to that team. They're looking for a, to fill a particular gap in a particular team. You might be an outstanding professional, but not the right fit for that gap. But you want to be really clear on what you bring to that team so that if that's the gap they're looking to fill, you'll be the person who impresses them. So in terms of strategy and being really tactical, what other sorts of things could, for example, a junior or mid-level international educator do in order to, you know, help step their career up a couple of levels? Again, for me, I think it is, it's this big picture for me. It's, it's trying to understand all the different facets of international ed. You can't read everything that ever comes out, but you can pick a couple of really clever commentators who whose work interests you and make sure you read the information that's coming out from them to get a sense of where we sit. The example I would give at the moment, there's a university's accord underway uh, or a discussion underway. It's a really big thing. It's going to have a huge impact on universities and any impact on universities has an impact on international education. Trying to get a sense of what that might mean, of the discussions that are underway, of who our allies might be in that conversation, to me, that's really important. Um, there are opportunities within the office that you sit in. There are opportunities within your institution. I always, um, one of the things being a fencer at Notre Dame is that I didn't often get to go to extracurricular things. I was always at training or away on a weekend at competitions. And I missed going to public lectures and then coming back to Australia and working in universities, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so lucky. I get to go to public lectures on climate change. I get to go to public lectures on social change, on all the things that are happening. 
um, even when I wasn't in this level and I didn't get officially invited, I always kept an eye on things that were going on in the university and went along to them. And as my kids have been growing up, you know, I said, oh, the bad astronomer's coming to Griffith. One of our physics people's bringing him in to my son. Let's go and see. Let's go and watch him in action. We have such a gift of having all of these extra things. We're surrounded by brilliance and that brilliance is often on display and you have an opportunity to go and listen to it. And you then also meet up with your colleagues from other parts of the university. You start to build that network of people not only who can support you, help you and educate you about the organisation, but who are likely to rise through the ranks with you and be your future senior colleagues. Can we talk a little bit more about that? I mean, you said a really interesting word um, just now, which was allies. Uh, And allies are are both internal inside an organisation, but also external. How have you gone about fostering allies across the industry? If you give, you will get back. You have to be willing to to share information that's helpful to others if you then expect them to do the same with you. I think about the International Directors Forum, of which I'm a member, an amazing group of people who do share and within that there's a subgroup who are my key people, my key go-to. So if I have a question, if we're seeing something concerning about visa issue rates out of a particular country and I'll call and say, are you seeing the same thing we're seeing? What are you doing about it? Do you have any strategies on it? It's really important to have those people, and particularly for me, I've, this is my 17th year at Griffith, so I am pretty immersed in the way Griffith does things, and even though I worked in two other universities, it was a long time ago, it's really important that I have other institutions, people I can call on to say, am I seeing this the right way, or am I just thinking about it with a Griffith head? But again, when they call me and want some help or want to send a team of theirs up to do a little bit of benchmarking or to see how we're managing a particular system, you have to give at that time too. And now my, I guess the thing I'm trying to do now is make sure that the staff who report to me, my deputy, my managers, that each of them have a similar network around their areas of work, people they can comfortably reach out to and um, and speak to when they have a sticky problem. I know with Griffith, we're part of Innovative Research Universities. We have a professional development forum in the international domain every year focused on a different problem and a different set of people. And I just see the enormous value when one of my team members comes back and says, I have a new network of people that I can reach out to when something's challenging me or when there's an opportunity. One of the things that I imagine might be difficult when you've got great relationships internally, externally, etc., is that people come and ask you for lots of favours because you're approachable, easy to talk to, you know, they've got to feel like they've got a relationship with you, but sometimes you're going to have to say no. In fact, often maybe you have to say no. I was going to barge in and say maybe it's not just favours, maybe it's also just a matter of time management, trying to, it, it all impacts on your time, right? And I imagine it's in short. I rarely say no, but again, I, I do feel feel a responsibility for us to mentor and support the next generation of professionals and that's not in age but in you know coming through the industry and up and the same for colleagues across my university who might not be an international but are seeking some advice on navigating universities and university politics and structures again I love people so anything that is interacting with people is actually generally pretty positive experience for me Because I drive to Brisbane at least two days a week, which is about an hour each way in the car, that time is invaluable. So when people say, can I talk to you about something, I'll often say, can you call me at 5.45? I'll be in the car driving home to the Gold Coast. And that's effectively dead time. Otherwise, not really. I listen to podcasts and books. But um, but it's a great time to catch up with people. And so it's, it's about fitting it in. Anybody who tries to get me after I get home won't get me. So I'm, my evenings for me are probably my sacrosanct time where I try to spend time with the kids, grown-up kids such as they are, and, and time with the dogs and be a little more focused on home life. Does that work? It does, although some nights, of course, because they're young adult kids, they're not home and it's just me and the dogs. <laughs> and they don't need me, but I still need that, that downtime where I'm not thinking about work, where I'm doing something other than work. The reason I ask is because the time management side of things is really hard. International ed is on, particularly once you, you know, you're at a level such as yours. I mean, the demands are incredible. I imagine you'd be getting hundreds of emails a day, um, back-to-back meetings throughout the day. 
how do you manage that workload? Do you, what, do you have a system for approaching those sort of things? Even if it's a loose one, you know, like prioritizing human issues over, um, you know, other sorts of issues. It's probably more structural than that, Rob. I hate to say, you know, we work within fairly defined structures in universities. So, you know, there are a number of people above me who sit in the senior executive. That's your first priority. If you get any kind of contact or email or question from someone in the senior executive or one of their representatives, an executive officer or someone, that's your first priority. At the same time, if I had a staff member who was distressed and inevitably with a with a big staff at any given time, people are dealing with all kinds of personal and professional issues. I am very much an open door. Although I say that my door is usually shut because I'm also about quite loud and I'm trying to protect everyone who sits outside my office from my noisiness. But I think most of our team know that if there's something they need to talk about, they can come to me. That if I get news from their manager that somebody has, you know, lost a parent or is dealing with a, a sick sick child or something like that, I will usually text them. I'll usually say, can I have their phone number and send them a text just so they know that they are more than just a piece of equipment in our office you know they're a human being and that we know these things have a big impact on their work I also because I'm I'm social if I have a big day of time in the office usually about 3 30 in the afternoon if I can I'll go and do a little wander around the carols you know outside my office just because I need some human contact and that's always a good chance to check in too or you know sometimes you see someone something's not quite right you can check in with people um other than that, the rest, you just try to churn through. I don't put in as many hours as I did before COVID or, or during COVID. I have to be honest, and I, I said this to Sarah, my boss, when we started to emerge from COVID, I said, I feel like COVID has absolutely worn me out because, of course, all the wonderful parts of our job, the bit where we connect with international colleagues at international conferences, the bit where we hold big student events and celebrate their achievements, all of that was gone. And what we were left with was all the problems and all the challenges and the students who had no jobs and couldn't afford their rent and had nothing to eat. My, I'll be honest, my approach during that was solve a problem every day. It won't be a wasted day if you've solved a problem for someone. If you can solve 20 problems, even better, but do not have a day where you don't solve a problem for someone. But I'll be honest that once we got through it, I thought, and, and the other thing was working at home was not great for me because I did not have great discipline. I'd break, walk the dogs, organise dinner and then kind of get drawn straight back into the computer and work till 11 o'clock at night. And I said to Sarah, I can't do that anymore. I need to carve off. My weekends have become a little more my time and I try to reserve only a small bit of that to prepare for the week ahead. And I'm trying, again, being back in the office, trying to solve things over telephone calls as well, not, not have to have everything be an endless chain of emails that just fills your inbox. I definitely agree with that one. That's something that's something I've been trying to do more lately. I sort of, if when an email comes in and I look at it, I'm like, okay, is this going to be more than three or four emails? If it is, then the answer is pick up the phone and ask the question or schedule time to, to discuss in a meeting with, with people who need to be involved. Well, that's something I'm naturally inclined to do because I think yeah. I like to talk to people and I feel like sometimes it's it's a lot more efficient because you can get to the point rather than, yes, exchanging a few emails. But I also think that it's maybe in to some extent getting trickier because people are getting more and more used to just ex exchanging even just text messages when before they would have naturally picked up the phone. So I think there's almost sometimes a reluctance from some people to talk. It's like, oh, almost an invasion of space. So... It's something that I'm naturally inclined to do, but I feel that depending on who you've got on the other end, it, it can be more or less effective. I agree. That's going to be probably a generational challenge for us. And again, my, my kids are 21 and 19 and the thought of someone phoning them, they find completely abhorrent unless it's their best friend and they're video calling and they're literally living life together as if they were in the room together through the phone for an hour. Other than that, it is all messaging and, and texting and I think that's going to be a challenge for us in terms of the generations and as we hire younger staff and their expectations about workplace flexibility and about how you communicate with people. Um, I am challenged on the communication front by too many avenues. You know, the fact that I get messages via email, LinkedIn, 
Teams, phone, text, sometimes via Facebook Messenger, sometimes via Instagram, sometimes via Twitter, and trying to remember where a message came from when I want to go back and revisit it, that I haven't nailed that one yet. That's, I think, a big challenge for all of us. There's actually an AI app that's being developed at the moment so that you can install on your computer and that will literally uh, memorize everything, so to speak, and then you can ask it um, where did that message come from. So if you feel comfortable having it run all the time, you, you can turn it off when you want to. Um, it will happily tell you uh, where your message came from or who sent it or which app it was That's from. great news, Maureen, for me. <laughs> It, it's amazing. I mean, the only, the only problem, of course, is it's got to look over everything that you do, literally everything. So uh, you have to be pretty comfortable with the provider. But outside of that, technology is definitely going to help us. As you were speaking, what I was thinking about was um, this kind of fine balance, particularly when you're like junior mid-stage staff member, and you've got a really hairy problem that you're trying to solve. And there's this, there's this balance between um, stepping up to the plate and trying to solve that yourself uh, without having to put a burden on people who are who, who you report to, and and asking for help, what advice or do, where do you see that line being for somebody that's trying to make that decision about where whether or not they should go for help with a particular problem? If that's a question, do I need help with this? Then you probably do, but then I would say to my team, I'd say, bring me solutions, be solutions oriented. Check in anything with me. I say to them, there is no silly question. You can check in anything. If there's that little bit of uncertainty that that might not be the right decision, come and see me. But don't come and see me with just a problem. And this is training I had as I came up through. Come and see me and say, this is what I think we should do. And I will say, that's perfect. Or do it just a little bit differently. Perhaps respond this way. And that I think actually is a manager's job or a leader's job. There are still things I go to my boss with and say, this is the situation. I'm not actually clear on the path forward. We could do this. We could do this. And then she will say to me, no, no, that's the right thing to do. And I think I'm assuming she has that same conversation with her boss higher up the university until I guess you get to the point of vice chancellor where um, it all rests with you up to a point. But we all have to have that. And I suspect even vice chancellors have mentors that they reach out to in those difficult moments to say, I'm facing a sticky situation. What do you think I should, What? which do you think is my best course of action? I, I kind of came to the realisation that I would always be a very good 2IC. Um, I was always very grateful to have Maureen as being the CEO of, of our companies because I feel like I'm very good at up to a certain level, but I, I just love having that extra level above me where I can say, okay, this I really need help with or you're much better at this than me, this is your this is your kind of remit. So do, do you think people need to think about um, reaching the summit or is it okay to be like, no, I'll be I'll be very good to it too, I see, you know? I don't think. The summit has to be your summit. can't be anyone else's summit. I'm exactly like you, Rob. I always say I'm a really good lieutenant. I'm really good at someone outlining the vision and I will help to operationalise it and make it work for everyone and deal with the details. I've worked in unis a long time. I'm actually a highly skilled bureaucrat in terms of understanding how the rules, the policies, the procedures and the people piece all fit together. And I always say all the time, I'm a really good lieutenant. I don't aspire to be at the next level. I love my job. I think I have the best job in the university. I really do. But I think it's the same all the way down. When you hit the job that you love, unless you desperately desire to keep moving up or sometimes obviously money is an imperative, you don't have to aspire to keep moving up. And in fact, when I was first asked to be deputy director here, I said no four times before I said yes, because I was thinking about the age my kids were, the workload that it would involve. And I was right about the workload it would involve. It was a really difficult transition. For anyone who has kids, who's had the transition from year two to year three, there are certain periods in life that are difficult, big jumps. They're not little tiny steps into the next level. And, and for me, that step into deputy director was a big jump. I had a very um, definite boss who was able to give me plenty of guidance and who was happy to do vision and let me deal with detail too at that point. But, um, but you, again, you have to be careful what you wish for because it does have an impact. 
And I don't think you should have to want to be the top of everything. You should decide where is it that you're really happy um, and what you're comfortable doing. What I did discover that I might not have expected is when you become the director, the loveliest thing about it is that actually you can impact change. You can influence the decisions. You can look at the things that you used to complain about and say, okay, well, what would I do differently? How might I change that? Or if people are going to complain about this, how would I justify the decision I've made? And you're in a bit more of a position of influence to do that. And that's a real, um, it's, a, it's a luxury really uh, in a university, but something I think that we all take really seriously. Have you got an example you'd be happy to share? Well, no, it's, it's not really an example. It's probably an example of what I learned during COVID. So during COVID, again, in the student support domain, things were changing rapidly. The rules were, it literally felt like the rules were changing in terms of government daily. The impact on students was changing daily. We all talked about flying the plane while you build the plane because we were trying to respond rapidly to an unknown, with an unknown time frame. And we were making decisions, and not just me, there were decisions being made well above me about certain things where we'll we'll allow this provision for students that then we had to put into action. At the next couple of layers down from me, the International Student Advisory Team, it was an extraordinarily challenging period for them. The rules kept being changed. Their advising of students is premised on a bunch of rules around how what your study load has to be, what the conditions of your visa are, what are the situation in terms of your part-time work, um, what happens if you need to withdraw, are you eligible for a refund? All of the certainties of their role disappeared, but they changed day by day. And the feedback from them, unsurprisingly, was decisions are being made without consulting us. And I remember thinking at the time, there is no time to consult you and I'm not making these decisions, I'm operationalising them. Um, but But looking back, if I could change what I did during that time, it would have been to invest a bit more thought and time into communicating the why constantly because everybody in the organisation was having things done to them. They were being told day by day, today you're on campus, tomorrow you're not on campus, without a lot of reasoning because there just wasn't time. And I just think, I would hope that if I ever go through another crisis or hopefully not as large, exactly, that um, that actually I would remember that communication is everything and that the more you can take people on that journey, the more likely that they will be comfortable passengers as you go through. It's like they say in politics, by the time you're getting sick and tired of saying the same thing over and over and over, people are just dying to listen to you. Exactly. So you've got to keep going. Exactly. <laughs> Always. Uh, I wanted to ask look, just a little bit of uh, about policy and and getting things done inside institutions. You talked about being a good institutional operator and operationalizer. Do you have a go-to way for getting things done? I've heard often in universities, you know, the crash or crash through or seek forgiveness, not permission kind of mantra. But then there's that whole other approach, which is like, let's go and get this ticked off by the top committee because once it's approved up there, Everyone has to accept that as law. Do you have a have an approach that you like to take? It's all about the people and the relationships. And again, a, a challenge of COVID was not being on campus and not having incidental contact or informal contact with colleagues, not being able to build relationships with new senior colleagues. But for me, it's always been about the relationships, being able to ask the question, being able to pose the problem. I have... I'm, I'm not the longest standing person at Griffith by a long shot. I have some colleagues who've been here a very long time who are just amazing. They have huge corporate memory and they know all the things that have been tried before. They're in that position to say, yeah, that won't work. And this is why. To be able to call one of them and say, let me throw my problem at you and what I think we should do and you tell me why it will or won't work and what my next steps are and have those conversations first and then move things into action. But I think, too, you have to, to me, it's really important that if you don't know something that you say, I don't know, you you become a trusted source of information for your colleagues in the reverse when you are willing to say, I don't know the answer to that, but I know who I can ask and I'll come back to you. I think the biggest risk you can make is to actually think that you have to know everything to impress the people above you or alongside you because if you get it wrong, then you lose that trust instantly. 
And so, again, for me, it's it's all about the people. The biggest thing about time, you talked before about finding the time, committee papers, they're the really big one. Committees, I sit on a lot of committees and it's part of my role at Griffith to reflect the needs of international, Griffith International, and the various things that we look after, international students, outbound mobility, aid projects, such that when I'm at a committee and something comes up and it might affect that work, that I'm able to talk about, well, you need to think about these things, and that I can bring back from those committees things that are being discussed and thought about or projects that are being undertaken that will have an impact on us and prepare our team for that. But reading committee papers is is enormously challenging because they're lengthy and complex and sometimes it's 300 pages. Just finding the time to do that. Years ago, I asked our then, um, he was our chief operating officer and he'd been here a long time. He was fairly stern and I just said, how do you do it? How do you get through all your emails? How do you get through all the papers? And I was a much more junior staff member then and he said, um, you have to learn to skim. You have to get really good at, at trying to work out what do I really need to know here? And which bits am I not going to be called on to have a, an opinion on and, and be a little more selective about what you read? It's the less exciting part of international <laughs> committee papers. You know, it's actually something that I learned at university where we, we were given a book and told, okay, you've got a half an hour and you've got to present the book just to force you to try to skim the book and get the gist of it and be able to then explain it on to someone else without having properly had a chance to read the book. You were talking about the impact of COVID on... Uh, people in international education and the teams and the work during that period. But what impact do you think COVID's had and is still having on students and uh, international education now? I think we are seeing the mental health impact on a generation of students. I lived it firsthand with my daughter starting university in March 2020, doing three weeks of classes and then COVID hit and it moved online and She is not an online learner and it did not go well. And again, great for terrible personal experience, great for empathy when you're thinking about your students who've moved here from overseas and are stuck somewhere alone in a unit, uh, not able to go anywhere, trying to study online. Um, I do think we're seeing the mental health impact. We're seeing it in the statistics of uptake of services. Um, I think that Some of our students, you know, think about our Chinese students who were in China when COVID hit and have now finished degrees in apartments in China. It'll be interesting to see all the the soft skills or the professional skills we talk about that are so important for students to develop, particularly as undergraduates, around communication and teamwork and the ability to influence and the ability to be flexible. It'll be interesting to see whether those the development of those skills has been impacted by students not having a more traditional experience in those years. Hopefully, they will counter that with enormous resilience, you know, through surviving something at a young age. As as someone older, we can kind of say, well, that was a couple of years of my life and that was pretty dreadful, but we've got a lot more experience to draw on as we were going through it. I think for that younger generation, it's a lot more challenging. But they always say when they look at big world crises and 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 world pandemics, that huge creativity comes out of them. So I'll, I'll be interested too to see what happens with this generation. We have this opportunity we talk about to, to transform the delivery of higher ed as well. Um, I'm interested to see. I'm not, I'm not a visionary, so I can't envision what that might look like, but I think there are cleverer people than me who are probably working on this. And I think that'll be interesting for universities and interesting for international education in in terms of what what might that look like in the future? How might students participate in university? Um, Is there still going to be the demand for the traditional experience, which which I hope there will, um, or will there be much greater flexibility all around and, and students expect their lives to be more divided? The big challenge I see at the moment is that most universities, if not all in Australia, move their lectures online and have kept them online and they've moved back to -to face-to-face workshops and tutorials but lectures have stayed online because it's really efficient and it works really well for Aussie students who don't want to have to come to campus for one hour, who have jobs and families and lives. I worry a little bit about our international students who are uprooting their lives and spending a significant investment in coming here 
to have an experience that includes people and networks and creating those. We will see how our student feedback fares over time, I think, for Australia in particular and things like the ISB, how we look in terms of the academic experience, whether our international student community embraces that increased flexibility or whether in fact it changes their university experience. Our guest today has been Heidi Piper, who's the Director International at Griffith University. And if you've been listening to this discussion and thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, well, I'm not an extrovert, I'm an introvert, and I'm really bad at getting out and talking to people. The person that you first and foremost want to get to meet in Australian international education when you go to your first international education conference is Heidi, because nobody will give you a better welcome and nobody I think is more generous with their time and wisdom. So Heidi, it's been awesome having you with us on Global Horizons. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Rob and Maureen. It's been delightful. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.